microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the first week of 2014. For more than 20 years, this program has been, almost 25 years now that I think about it, this program has been a spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on a so-called community radio station, and when censored and locked out of there, welcomed, I'm happy to say, by the good folks at Urbana Public Television. I'm Carl Esterbrook. My discussants tonight are Ron Zoke, the toast of Tsurkaya Street, Moscow's main street where he has fans, and David Green, the pride of Illinois' 13th Congressional District, where he's a candidate in the March Democratic primary. Our program's name, News from Neptune, was chosen to honor Noam Chomsky, who's been talking since about American politics for more than twice the 20-some years we've been on the air. Chomsky has said that in the American media, quote, either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune, close quote. Today is January 3rd, 2014. On this day in the year 1521, the Bishop of Rome, Leo X Medici, excommunicated a German priest and academic, a biblical scholar uh, named Martin Luther for his criticism, uh, his published criticism of church doctrine. Uh, it's important to note that uh, the dispute was always a theological dispute. Uh, it's been repeated as a complaint of Luther about corruption in the church, and it was, that's true to some extent, but what Luther, the corruption Luther was complaining about was doctrinal corruption. His charge was that the central order, the central organs of the uh, Roman church were teaching heresy. Uh, notably, the thousand-year-old heresy called Pelagianism. Uh, Pelagianism goes back to a dispute of uh, Augustine of Hippo in the fifth century, and it refers to the notion that one could, as it were, earn one's way into heaven by good deeds and doing the right sort of stuff, uh, that God uh, was a, uh, a debtor, so to speak, uh, to those who uh, behaved well. Uh, Pelagianism, the notion that uh, uh, one earned one's salvation, uh, Luther charged was being taught by the Church of Rome. Uh, Church of Rome re rejected that notion, uh, but it also rejected Luther's criticism of the institutions that he thought were engaged in these uh, uh, ideologically incorrect practices. Uh, it comes up in a funny way this week. Yesterday on the BBC, the musician P.J. Harvey guest edited a program including uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the ex-Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, uh, and uh, 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 Julian Assange. The theological point, interestingly enough, was raised by Julian Assange, the Reformation point. Uh, he used the unlikely platform of a religious slot on the BBC's Today program to condemn attempts by the U.S. and U.K. governments to acquire what he called a godlike knowledge of citizens through mass surveillance. Assange, who's been holed up in the embassy in London, the embassy of Ecuador in London for more than a year, delivered a sermon about the importance of freedom of information and liberating hoarded knowledge, as he called it, uh, in a program called Thought for the Day, uh, an hour-long program on the BBC. Uh, Assange said disclosures by the security contractor Edward Snowden about the scale of mass surveillance by the U.S. and U.K. security services had exposed how governments and corporations seek, seek to know more and more about us while, quote, we know less and less about them. And his criticism has some interesting echoes this week in that two uh, le leading regime-friendly newspapers, uh, the New York Times in this country and The Guardian in London, both came out calling for a, uh, an amnesty of some sort for uh, Snowden. Uh, 
Assange, of course, still faces arrest if he leaves the London Embassy of Ecuador. Uh, the U.S. is clearly after him for stealing secrets. Uh, and he was chosen to appear on this program by uh, P.J. Harvey, uh, the guest editor, uh, a music interesting musician who picked some interesting people uh, who don't normally turn up on uh, the BBC. And uh, the outrage from the putative left in, in England was interesting. Uh, severe criticism from Labour MPs that uh, Julian Assange should be allowed to appear on the BBC. Um, P.J. Harvey called him, quite correctly, uh, a person of great courage who had, and I'm quoting, opened a door to freedom that ought to be the essence of democracy. Uh, the, connect, the roundabout connection here is that uh, Assange likened contemporary mass surveillance to the way the Catholic Church operated during the Reformation, he said, but he meant before the Reformation. He said, and I'm quoting Assange here, through the confessional system, the Catholic Church spied upon the lives of its congregants, while Latin mass excluded most people who could not speak Latin from an understanding of the very system of thought that had bound them. Uh, now, knowledge, uh, this, this is Assange continued, knowledge has always flowed upwards to bishops and kings, not down to serfs and slaves. The principle remains the same in the present era. Documents disclosed by NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden show that governments dare to aspire through their intelligence agencies to a godlike knowledge of each and every one of us, close quote. Uh, and he went on in this theme, apparently, um, uh, uh, occasioned by the fact that this was uh, a program inserted in the uh, semi-religious thought for the day section at the BBC. Uh, Assange, maybe to court his BBC audience, employed a peculiarly English caricature of the pre-Reformation church. Uh, it's not a good description indeed of how the system worked. Um, it's a uh, you know, Rowan Williams, for example, would have had a better notion of it, but he, he didn't get to talk about that. Uh, the historical inaccuracy of Assange's account shouldn't detract from the quite accurate account he gave of the contemporary situation. So, uh, uh, one more connection on this. You're watching Aware on the Air, the excommunication edition, and it happens that today is the anniversary in 1962 uh, of the announcement that the papacy, in this case Pope John XXIII Roncalli, uh, had excommunicated, Fide excommunicated Fidel Castro. That turns out to be false. It wasn't true. It didn't happen. But it was being used by right-wing elements in the Roman Church uh, to support the American uh, assault against the Cuban Revolution. Uh, and it turns up still in the standard histories that we read in the, um, uh, of the Cold War. Uh, it even turns up on WikiLeaks, by the way. It wasn't so, but uh, there it is. Uh, you know, it's in WikiLeaks, so it's got to be the case. Um, Another story that didn't get into WikiLeaks that should, that I wanted to mention, uh, Democracy Now!, I'm happy to say, ran a series on it last week, um, uh, a week before last, rather. Uh, this is uh, Piero, Piero Glehises' book, Visions of Freedom, Havana, Washington, Pretoria, and the Struggle for Southern Africa, 1976 to 1991. This is practically the only account in English published by Obscure University Press, but it, it tells the story that doesn't uh, get into our account of the Cold War, uh, didn't even get into the account of the uh, uh, hagiography around the death of Nelson Mandela, that it was Cuba that really brought down apartheid in South, Southern Africa and defended southwestern Africa against the imperial designs of apartheid South Africa. Uh, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of history that somehow doesn't get recorded uh, for political reasons. You're, I was impressed again by that. I'll come back to that perhaps if we have time. Uh, for my sins, I sat and read uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s letters uh, this week, which have just been published. 
You're watching, uh, aware, uh, <laughs> watching news from Neptune, <laughs> the excommunication edition. Uh, and we will begin with the only man I know who has more hats than the Pope, uh, Ron Zote. Yes, well, my theme uh, today, I guess, is going to be 2014, Groundhog Year. Uh, all of the old arguments uh, keep recurring and uh, all of the same political problems and uh, social injustices. And uh, we keep seeing them over and over and over again. Uh, as the protagonist did in uh, the movie Groundhog Day, and uh, uh, I'm getting uh, uh, a little tired of it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, uh, some uh, headlines first to uh, lighten things uh, up a bit. Uh, I'm wearing another silly hat to uh, uh, help make the program more popular, I hope. Uh, if I appear uh, eccentric, people will start to feel uh, superior and they may uh, tune us in and uh, so they can have that feeling. We and, have a following uh, among haberdashers now, right, too. Right, right. So uh, uh, make of that what you will. <laughs> Headline. Study, early exposure to nuts may help tolerance. I love the ambiguity of that. It's actually about pregnant women's diet, but uh, are you tolerant of nuts? I hope so. Well, it's tempted to make a rude joke, right? <laughs> and uh, the prize headline of the week on Fox News uh, online, North Korean leader fed uncle to starving dogs, report says. The execution of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's uncle was more brutal than initially reported, according to a Beijing-controlled newspaper which said the country's second most powerful figure was thrown into a cage filled with starving dogs and eaten alive. There's been no confirmation of this by anyone. It's just one report, but uh, uh, it's amusing. The Singaporean Straits Times cited a report uh, from Wen Wing Po, a Beijing-controlled newspaper that said Jiang Song Dek and five close associates were stripped and fed to 120 dogs that had not eaten for three days. The entire process, witnessed by 300 senior officials, lasted for about an hour. The report says Fox News could not immediately verify the report. It was clearly staged for the benefit of those 300 yeah, right. senior officials, right? Yeah, Saying, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, it was a demonstration. Yeah. This, this could happen to you, so yeah. stay in line. Yeah, where's A.J. Liebling, who write, used to write the Wayward uh, Press and so on? The many reports of uh, the enormous uh, Taiwan uh, army and the many reports of the death of Chairman Mao. That was reported maybe 20 times before, it, or more times before it actually happened. But uh, anyway, short takes on uh, Moyers and Company. Moy Bill Moyers is becoming more and more alienated, I think, and uh, oh, I, radical. I think you're right. Yeah. But uh, uh, here are uh, some headlines. Uh, Benghazi, exhaustive reporting by the New York Times' David Fitzpatrick on what actually happened should put an end to the conspiracy theories, but it hasn't. Now they're being accused of uh, bias, and uh, the uh, bias is supposed to come from uh, they're preparing the way for uh, Hillary, and uh, so make of that again what you will. I think it's bunk, but anyway. Uh, the Guardian has a fascinating first-hand account of what it's like to work in the U.S. drone program. Yeah. Also, CNN reports that Afghanistan may be America's least popular war ever. Even more than Vietnam. Yeah, red mm -hmm. states, blue states. Well, the Washington Post, Dan Balls, reports that they're are an unprecedented number of states controlled by one party, and the old red-blue policy divide is growing. So streets are going, uh, states are going more and more to uh, extremes in both directions. Uh, the system has worked out to uh, encourage one party control of various states. And Illinois is uh, largely uh, democratic, but uh, there are other states uh, like Wisconsin and a few others we might mention that have gone in the other direction so radically that it's raising questions about the whole system of apportioning uh, delegates and drawing political maps and all that. 
But that's the important point, I think, Ron, and probably should be stressed. It's not because there has been a clear division of political opinion uh, amongst the voters. It's rather that the mechanisms, uh, decrepit as they are, of political representation in this country are more and more in the control of one group or the other, right. and in a sense, under both. I mean, these systems result from what's been called sweetheart gerrymandering, where the Republicans and Democrats essentially similar uh, in, their, in their politics, parcel out this sort of control, and uh, you take one, I'll take the other, and yeah. so forth, yeah. uh, w which has the effect, the primary effect, of excluding third parties, uh, whether it's the Tea Party or the Greens. And uh, so that's, that produces a stasis that gives you red states and blue states, as you say. Yeah. Uh, but the overall effect is to disenfranchise the American people who want different things, who, who, as you pointed out a moment ago, uh, are overwhelmingly opposed to the war in Afghanistan. Both parties support the war, indeed want to expand it, and that continues yeah. uh, because of their grasp of the political system. Yeah. Next, they do need a raise. Jonathan Martin and Martin Shear report for the New York Times that Democrats are embracing minimum wage hikes as a key issue in state and congressional races next year. Also, uh, judge upholds part of SeaTac's $15 per hour living wage, but leaves airport workers out in the cold. So uh, I've not been following all the details there, but uh, uh, we'll be hearing more about it uh, during Groundhog Year. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, Wall Street at uh, TNR uh, in uh, New Republic, I guess. Michael Konzal argues that this year's financial reform efforts were far more successful than anyone imagined that they would be. I doubt that very much, but anyway. Um, bad record to break. The nation's Allison Kilkenny reports that 2012 college grads have the most student debt ever. Mm-hmm. Papers, please. At reason, whilst Campbell looks at the growing resistance to internal immigration checkpoints, writes free zones miles from any international border crossing. Uh, horrible abuse of uh, people's rights, but uh, uh, there it is, and we're hearing very little about it. Next, uh, well, a funny one, plows made of crackers. In Wisconsin, where else? They're using cheese to de-ice roads. Experts say that provolone and mozzarella are the best. <laughs> so the cheese heads More found, tea, a, yes, exactly. have found a you. new use for it. Okay, uh, getting a little more serious here. Um, <laughs> on Newsmax today, the most extreme right-wing uh, news source that uh, I look at regularly, social conservatives plot a coup against the GOP over family issues by uh, Cynthia Fagan. Social conservatives are plotting a political coup on a GOP they deem has gone soft on issues such as gay marriage and abortion. Politico reported Thursday. Recently, a secret strategy session between leaders of the religious right and the wealthiest backers was held at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Northern Virginia over ways to enlist mega donors into their conservative civil war, according to Politico. During the mini summit by inv invitation only, which was closed to reporters, part of the shaping of the master plan included aggressive super PAC spending against Republicans in GOP primaries, holding repeats, holding retreats at the <laughs> Reagan ranch and holding donor conferences in Normandy for the 70th anniversary of the D-Day invasion. High ranking retired military officers have been consulted on military tactics that could be applied to campaign spending strategies. Uh, finally, uh, an opinion piece in the Washington Post, the Republican rejection of libertarianism and why it probably won't work. Libertarianism isn't all that conservative. That's, what the, that's the argument former Bush, administra Bush administrator, administration officials, Mike Gerson and Pete Wehner, offered in a new and important essay in National Affairs that posted today. Here's the key paragraph from that piece. Responsible, self-serving citizens do not grow wild like blackberries, which is why a conservative political philosophy cannot be reduced to untrammeled libertarianism. Citizens are cultivated by institutions, families, religious communities, neighborhoods, and nations. 
Parents and spouses, churches and synagogues, teachers and coaches, and the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts are among the foremost shapers of citizens in our republic. But government has a necessary, if limited, role in reinforcing the social norms and expectations that make the work of these civil institutions both, both possible and easier. That role can involve everything from enforcing civil rights laws to saving the elderly from indigence to restricting the availability of addictive uh, substances. So uh, there is a uh, slight opening in the uh, right wing uh, uh, <laughs> libertarian uh, narrative, perhaps, and we'll see which way the Republicans will go, whether they will uh, continue to uh, uh, accept losing national elections because of their uh, refusal to make an opening to uh, minorities, uh, to women, uh, and uh, uh, other groups, uh, the poor, uh, other groups that uh, are demanding representation. So what do you think? Um, response to that? I've, I've never called Ron's reports cheesy before, but you have a response <laughs> to this cheesy report? <laughs> Well, you know, you mentioned this column by Michael Gerson, who's a Washington Post writer, whose who's columns show up in the local paper every so often. And, yep. uh, not to be taken as a serious thinker, of course, but wants to, wants to act like one kind of, you know, David Brooks-ish kind of yeah. uh, approach. Um, can, the point is neither, nothing that's called conservatism now does any justice to whatever might have been good about a conservative philosophy in the 1700s, one that emphasized social bonds, one, one that yes. emphasized human, human relationship and how social change, capitalism or otherwise, affected those. So um, it's true that these libertarians that they're referring to, these that are, <clears throat> that we agree with in terms of their anti-war approach, still uh, in this country support a radical philosophy in which so-called markets determine human, human relationships. Um, but the kind of conservatism that Michael Gerson and the more quote-unquote respectable establishment people who are trying to get the Republican uh, Party on track by throwing a few crumbs to various identity politics type groups, that's not conservatism either. They're just, they're representing a corporate cl a clientele. Yeah. Um, I guess going back to what you started off with the red state, blue state that Carl already responded to to a certain extent, um, it's not a serious approach to understanding how politics work no. in this country right. to understand it in terms of this apparent divide between red states and blue states. I'm starting to think of it more like baseball leagues. You know, the, the, um, it, we've got the Democratic and Republican Party, right. and we've got the American and National Baseball League. And there's, yes, the Americans have... A, the, the difference between the Americans and the Nationals is that they use a de, what's called the de, designated hitter. Pitchers don't have to bat. Right. That's the only difference. It, it used to be, you know, people are taught to, you know, it used to be when there were two, two baseball teams in a lot of cities, you would identify, of course, in the south side of Chicago or the north right. side of Chicago. That's about the nature of difference between red states and blue states, mm -hmm. being a Cubs fan or a Sox fan. And the woman I'm running against in my race for Congress, Ann Callis, is someone who could have just as easily been recruited by the, by the Republican Party Crucial to represent point. this district as the, the, the Democratic Party. Um, the main difference is, is that the main difference that she'll draw between herself and Rodney Davis, the current congressperson, is that she supports women's re reproductive rights and she supports gay marriage. I can't think of any other issue in which she would seriously, seriously distinguish herself from Rodney Davis. Although, yes, she might oppose the government shutdown, but she's supporting all, you know, she, port, she supports the basic view that the government has to get out of debt. So she's running in the Democratic Party because there was an opening for someone to run in the other corporate party. The Republican Party was already, job was already taken. I think uh, you know, I think that's absolutely right, David. I think it may be worthwhile pointing out, though, that there is a, a, a fissure in the Republican Party um, that 
uh, is, I, I think, important. In fact, I've argued that we may be on the verge of a, a, a realignment of the various uh, uh, class interests in American politics. It seems to happen periodically in, in American politics. But the, the real difference b between the two wings of the Republican Party, uh, and, as it exists right now, is that um, what we tend to talk of as libertarian um, uh, the, the libertarian wing is, uh, as you point out, uh, generally anti-war, anti-interventionist. Ron Paul went as far as any American politician a long time in a long time in saying that the overseas bases that the United States has should be dismantled and the troops brought home to provide defense for our own borders, but not defense, uh, not forward defense, uh, as, as has been the case of Americans uh, uh, in the world, American forces in the world at large for generations. Uh, so this, this, this wing of the Republican Party is anti-interventionist. It's also anti-Wall Street. Now, this takes the form of arguments, say, audit the Fed and so forth and so on. But the bailout of Wall Street, which both parties connived in um, uh, after the, uh, the, the financial crisis of 2007, uh, is uh, anathema to this wing of the Republican Party. Uh, and it's this that really meant that the Republicans in their convention last year had to sit on that wing of the party, make sure that it didn't fly, make sure that it didn't go any place at all, suppress the Ron Paul movement, not because of their theoretical views, but because of their anti-war and anti-Wall Street views. Um, the major, op the major uh, branch of the Republican Party, like the major branch of the Democratic Party, is pro-war and pro-Wall Street. And we've seen that without any question in the, in the Obama administration. So the possibility of some serious divisions, divisions that would actually have policy implications for military and economic policy, uh, that's interesting. And I, I'll be interested in seeing if anything, anything comes of it. Um, we have right now a, a somewhat parallel split going on in the Democratic Party with our own junior senator, um, uh, 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 and Democratic ally, who's a Republican, but the junior senator of Illinois, with a good number of Democratic allies trying to undermine the uh, administration's rearrangement of its relationships with Iran. Uh, and that's, 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 that's fairly interesting. The split's not so deep as the split within the Republican Party, but the split is there. And uh, um, we saw, you know, Democrats voting for, or not voting for the extension of, uh, of uh, unemployment. We saw Democrats voting for uh, a more vigorous anti-Iran policy than the administration is willing to uh, voting for war against Iran. Um, and uh, with this sort of fissure within the Democratic Party, uh, things get interesting uh, on the floor of Congress, uh, even though the, the, dif the differences are not the ones that would be predicted by the party distinctions. Aren't uh, the current uh, favorites of the libertarian right and the Republicans, uh, Ted Cruz and Rand Paul? I mean, what is their stand on uh, our foreign adventures? Well, it's not at all clear that either one of these represents that uh, anti-war enthusiasm that uh, uh, the elder Paul uh, spoke up for. I think the son is not the equal of the father in this regard, although Rand Paul knows the differences there and plays to it every now and then. Uh, I think he may be uh, uh, less, uh, how shall we put it uh, gently, consistent than his father is on this point. But the, uh, the Republican comers uh, all are traditional Republicans, uh, pro-war, pro-Wall Street, and uh, uh, not, uh, uh, not, not the basis for any sort of, um, uh, of anti-interventionist politics. Name one. The, the, ones, the ones you just named. I mean, Cruz, Christie, uh, these people are traditional Republicans as far as these two issues are concerned, right? Oh, just those issues. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's clear that, the, that, the, um, that these people don't represent the you know, Republican base and are trying to figure out how to get exactly. a base of both, of both Republicans and maybe a few people like, let, you know, like let Latinos that are, that are known to be quote-unquote conservative. Um, but when you look at the Tea Party and, you know, the, what Alexander Coburn used to call the sort of petty, petty bourgeois basis of the Tea Party, what you're talking about is 
a kind of genuine conservatism, a kind of, of localism, uh, right-wing populism, a kind of conservatism that actually does respect the human bonds that create, that are, that are sort of locally based and that they see as being, as being threatened by Wall Street and globalization. And traditionally, these were the people that were called I isolationists that were threatened by yeah. American involvement in the world. So there still is that, that echo of the, of the quote-unquote real Republican conservatism of, say, the 1930s or even 1950s. But clearly in this new multinationalized, military, industrially complexed world, th these people like Chris Christie and Ted Cruz cannot, they can, they can manipulate those people in various, pro, various sort of blue state, red state, issue-oriented ways, guns, God, etc. but they can't represent, they can't really speak to the, the genuine dis, disaffection of these people. And of course, these people, these bourgeois, petty bourgeois people, can't really put it in, put their own dis, disaffection in terms that create a, a rational political program. Yeah, there's what I would call localism, and there's a good deal of wisdom in that sometimes, what the anthropologists call local knowledge and so on, which is important. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, I wouldn't want to uh, characterize that negatively, but uh, I think at the same time there is a good deal of wisdom sometime in yeah. some of the things that the classical conservatives have said. Um, uh, I mean, Burke, and yeah. more recently, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Michael Oakeshott, mm -hmm. who uh, is, or was, really uh, quite brilliant. And there are many things that, uh, in his writings on rationalism and politics, that I think deserve to be taken seriously. But and one place we get that conjunction, Ron, and, and I have an articulate organ of that view uh, that joins it with uh, anti-war and anti-Wall Street thinking is the journal American Conservative, yes. uh, which, uh, and to its, a certain extent as well, um, the website antiwar.com, they're not run by the same people, uh, but, but there is a strain there of uh, that tradition uh, join, as I say, to anti-war and anti-Wall Street uh, thinking that is important, at least in terms of what's being said. Yeah. Now, its popular following is uh, uh, difficult to assess yeah. because it's mixed up with a lot of these other notions. Right. Well, they, uh, they publish things online anyway by Buchanan, who is very much into the nativist mold, and uh, they have a trouble dealing, some trouble dealing with uh, uh, immigrants and foreigners and all that stuff. But. At the same time, Buchanan has been, for all his uh, peculiarities, including perhaps racism, uh, Bu Buchanan has been a, uh, as it were, an establishment critic of wars going back to the Gulf War, the uh, George Bush Sr.'s Gulf War. He's pointed out how these wars are, uh, are, are based on lies, contrary to the principles that they're supposed to, uh, supposedly defending. And uh, he's been consistent about that all the way through. Uh, and his views are represented in this journal, American Conservative, which uh, he was involved in part in founding. So uh, the views are there and they don't fall along the lines that uh, the red state, blue state uh, distinction right. seems to suggest. Yeah. So those conservatives understand something about noblesse oblige, I think, if they consider themselves among the intellectual and moral uh, uh, nobility, as they seem to do. And uh, um, I think they have a point. Well, and even before the emergence of the Tea Party, they were characterized as paleo-conservatives, old conservatives, so to speak, as opposed to neo-conservatives, which represents the uh, uh, belligerent uh, pro-war approach uh, going back to uh, uh, a generation uh, to the... Um, uh, to the Clinton or, years. Or Jewish conservatives, as neoconservatives are sometimes called. Yeah, yeah. Yes, right. Uh, but that's, that's simpli that oversimplifies right. it, of course. You're watching uh, uh, News from Neptune. Uh, Ron's headlines 
prompts me to mention one that I liked in this morning's News Gazette. And I don't know whether we have the News Gazette headline writer to thank for this. It's on an AP story where the AP itself uh, brought, it, uh, brought it to us. The headline is, Toronto's mayor files for another crack at job. <laughs> Like that. I didn't get that when I first read it. <laughs> now I get it. That's you. <laughs> a little, I, you I live, haven't been following you that. You live too pure a life. I David. haven't been following that quite as closely as I, perhaps I should. Right, right. Um, yeah. uh, uh, David, would, you what, buy, would you buy a Ford from this man? <laughs> <laughs> Just don't buy crack from him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, what's, on, uh, what's on your agenda, David? My agenda. My agenda is... Other than getting elected, the, yes. Yes, yeah. well, this, and this is, relates to that, actually. Okay. My agenda is the fascinating topic that was brought to us in this last Sunday's commentary section of the News, News Gazette about all the problems that go along with college accreditation. Uh -huh. This is a, a hot issue, and I'm running against... I've already mentioned the woman I'm running against for Congress, Ann Callis, and now I'll mention... The gentleman, the physics professor, uh, George Gollin, who's trying to make a name for himself uh, first by busting what are called d diploma mills, uh, these places that sell pieces of paper that allow people to claim that they're doctors and lawyers and accountants and various various scams like that. But That's apparently... A comfortable description of some. Yes, something. right. And um, what... The, the general issue of, he, he also refers on his website as one of his sort of education reform talking points is to be an advocate for better quality accreditation of American higher ed and all that goes along with that. There's a concept known as alignment, which is means that uh, this shouldn't be too difficult to understand, but still apparently it's it becomes... Uh, it, it becomes a problem that um, college, apparently high schools and colleges have trouble offering the courses that colleges and grad, graduate schools need for their applicants to have. I'm not sure why that should be in this day and age such a big problem. It seems like all the, in, all the information is out there on the web, but high school, the district you know, administrators should be able to look stuff up and then offer the courses that are needed for various program, but let's set that aside. Let me read just a couple of paragraphs from this article to show you what I'm talking about here. Though largely out of sight of, of, most, of, of most Americans, uh, accreditors control the approvals that keep colleges and universities pulling in students and eligible for taxpayer dollars. The U.S. Department of Education and states rely on them when determining whether institutions are eligible for billions in taxpayer-funded financial aid. I would say read student loans, student debt into that. Yet, for decades, according to their critics, the accrediting agencies made up mostly of professors and administrators who judge the work of other professors and administrators rubber-stamped universities accreditations after reviewing their academics, student services, and finances every few years. As a result, quote, this is the quote from the uh, report that this article refers to from the American Enterprise Institute, quote, many accredited public and nonprofit colleges and universities across the country fall even, fail even basic tests of quality, yet remain accredited, end quote said a September report by the American Enterprise Institute, a Washington-based think tank, note conservative think tank, right-wing think tank. Accreditors have failed to protect taxpayers who invest billions in universities and colleges and threaten America's global competitiveness in higher education, the AEI report said. <sighs> Where to go with this? Yeah, yeah. Where, I mean, gentlemen, you are educated people. I'm claim to be an educated person. We've we got been around, the pieces of paper to prove it. We've right? been yeah, around right. these institutions for a long time. How, how to, at the same time, give this the lack of seriousness with which, with which it deserves while giving it the seriousness that it deserves? Because, you know, the problem isn't the problem. It's a much larger problem. The problem is 
the inflated importance we give to higher ed in this country and the kind of the moral hazard that comes up. What, what is moral hazard? As I understand it, you know, I, I think it's a kind of a legal term or an ethical term that gets thrown around a lot. I understand it. it's like when you get a lot of money into something and there's a lot at stake, people start cheating. They start finding ways to cheat. It's a result of the reward structure and the phoniness of the reward structure or maybe a reward structure that started out being kind of serious but then became phony because it got all kinds of other stuff involved in it. In economics, perverse incentives. Perverse incentives, uh -huh. okay. So that's what we have in higher ed in this country. I mean, if higher ed, if having a piece of paper in order to get a job and do something didn't matter quite so much, and if those jobs weren't quite so disparate in the rewards that they offered, and if there weren't so much money involved in student loans in higher ed, as a profit-making kind of thing. If there weren't all that stuff going on, people could just go to, go to college for free, learn what they felt they needed to know, get hired for businesses that weren't so concerned about what piece of paper they had, but what they actually do know. But we get back to the good old American class system. I mean, at bottom, it all gets back to that. We have a class system in this country. Schools from top to bottom are very much a part of this class system. And what we've developed in this country since World War II is a higher education system that sorts people out by giving them pieces of paper that are based on some merit, but mostly on the social class background of those students. And whereas ordinary people used to have unions to, set, to be able to once they got a job, they got into a union to protect them. What, what you do now is you get a piece of paper and you get into it, you, you get a piece of paper, hope, hopefully from what Carl, what you always call the better colleges, <laughs> and, it entitled, and you get all the people who went to the better colleges hiring each other and deciding how much each other gets paid. And that's called a, in old-fashioned medieval terms, that's called a guild. It's kind of an informal guild that says we're all a part of the same club and we control who gets into this club and once you get into this club, you get the advantages of controlling the market for people in this club, whether it's lawyers, doctors, accountants, co college professors. I'm not saying that people don't actually learn stuff when they go to college. I'm not saying people don't become more or less qualified for the jobs they get. But the system ultimately is corrupted and distorted by the, the class system and the moral hazards involved there. And thus, we read silly articles about phony problems created by this perverse system. We have a highly educated society. Certainly people darn well know how to accredit institutions and what to do the basic things that tell the students when they're going to an institution what they can expect and what they should know. And there's, there is a call for that. I mean, the system that we have, there is a call for people who do that sort of things, sort of thing. But it's also part of a larger con game. And it's un ultimately, it's undermined by being a part of that larger con game. And so what George Gollin, my opponent in the Democratic primary for US Congress in the 13th District, is doing is emphasizing this stuff. The word, the, the word that caught my eye in this article is watchdog. We need watchdogs of our higher ed system. And George Gollin has the word watchdog on the front banner of his website. And what could be more of a softball thrown down the middle of my plate than, than to deal with this, this particular issue as silly and boring as it ultimately is. Response to this, Ron? I, I don't know how to respond to all of these uh, <laughs> sports metaphors yeah. and uh, similes and so on. I'm not that big on sports. Actually, when I get the newspaper every morning, I pull out the sports section, put it in the recycling immediately. But You're missing the best part of the newspaper, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> could be, could be. But uh, yeah, what is the ultimate uh, criterion then against which we validate other 
uh, criteria of uh, quality of higher education institutions. There is no such Was thing, that, right? Right. I mean, it, it, we, we pretend, we, we use symbolic measures and things to pretend that somebody is getting a better education at Harvard than they're getting at Parkland College. Right. Whereas one can perfectly well have just as good a basic English literature class yes. at Parkland College as one has yeah. at Harvard. Yeah. It's the, we've obviously for a long time in this country given a lot of importance to the meaning of, of, a, of a degree from a particular college. And there's part of us inside that knows it's bogus. But there's another part of us that has to play the game. Yeah. Well, there's this problem of uh, corporations, businesses, not wanting to uh, pay for training their own people. They exactly. want to push off all of the uh, training onto uh, uh, the uh, other institutions. Uh, and uh, uh, anything, well, students in particular uh, uh, often are uh, uh, suckered into this by thinking that they want to study things that will be immediately useful to them right. after they get out of uh, college and uh, it just isn't so. Uh, the statistics show that they'll be working in an entirely separate uh, field from whatever their major was within a few years uh, after uh, graduation, if they have a job at all. And uh, it's just a, a big mess. The best thing they can learn is basic skills of uh, communication, general information, and so on, which will fit them for advancement. And if they want to become uh, uh, managers or uh, whatever, which is the only way of uh, really getting ahead, uh, if they are still being told that they get ahead by uh, hard work, uh, I think they're more and more suspicious, and rightly so, that that uh, will really work. How you really uh, get ahead and uh, get rich. What's what, ahead? Yeah. What's yeah. ahead? Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> why do we, why do we yeah. talk that way? Is what by, is getting ahead? Yeah, what by, by is that? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, getting really. ahead of other people and making more money than they do, apparently. Yes, that's, so, that's what life is all about, yeah. getting ahead. Right, right. All uh, right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the way you do that is by gaming the system. Uh, more and more people are realizing that. That's why the instances of uh, fraudulence uh, are climbing because the incentives to cheat and to uh, engage in deceptive behavior are uh, higher and higher. And uh, what do we do about that? It's the motto on the T-shirt at the Harvard Business School many years ago. Uh, he who dies with the most toys wins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> they were at least crass about it. This was the same business school where at the commencement, um, uh, instead of throwing their caps into the air, hey, those caps are expensive, uh, at the end of the commencement they waived dollar bills <laughs> or uh, higher denominations to show their yeah. greater commitment it's, it's to a the little crass. Of, yeah, right. Uh, the, uh, and, uh, yeah, you, I think, have quoted uh, before, uh, Ron, John Dewey's remark from uh, er early on in the 20th century, education is not preparation for life, education is life itself. That's right. And what we have is a business model, a corporate model, uh, a business model such as represented by the students I was quoting from one of our better universities a moment before. Um, a business model imposed upon colleges and universities. Years ago, I was teaching a uh, sociology course for my sins, and um, uh, I asked my students uh, uh, if they were, um, uh, this was anonymous and they were writing about it, so I had answers that were not constrained by their needing to get ahead. Um, uh, if they didn't have to think about getting a job. Well, started out with the notion, the primary reason they were taking the course was the course was required for a sociology major and they needed a sociology major because they thought it would help them get a job. Um, and what job did they want? Well, the, uh, pri the leading answer, interesting, was FBI agent, but uh, <laughs> you know, that was a while ago. Uh, in any case, the, uh, uh, but, but I continued the, uh, interrogation, uh, 
fine FBI fashion and said, if you didn't have to worry about getting a job uh, when you got out of college, if you were independently wealthy or you had a job already guaranteed, would you take this or similar courses? Overwhelming, no. Uh, what would you take? Overwhelming, art, music, uh, uh, theater, I mean, the arts were, but none of, everyone knew that taking those things were not lead to a job in most cases, and therefore you could not take them as, a, as an undergraduate in college. Uh, well, I thought that was interesting because that certainly is a suggestion that uh, John Dewey needs to be reco recalled and uh, education as life itself being thought a little more, uh, being applied a little more to uh, what yeah. actually happens in our universities. You go to the campus a mile or so uh, west of here, uh, north of Green Street, and you'll hear a lot of contempt expressed for uh, the uh, people south of Green Street who are studying art history and so on, all the BS courses. and. So uh, and, no, uh, well, that's uh, uh, unfortunate, but that's what has. But that's evolved. partly so, what. But, but but the class advantage of going to a better college, the social class advantage, still is partly wrapped up in the claim that when you go to one of these colleges, you get what's called a well-rounded education. <laughs> one of those words we should put on the chopping block, right? Because yes, it doesn't mean Coburn's any, corner. It doesn't yeah. mean anything, but. As a liberal, you still have to promote this idea that you're getting a liberal education, a well-rounded education before you get into medical school or law school or business school. And that somehow that gives you a humane perspective on being one of the top 20% or 10% or 5% or 1% or 1%. So all this terminology that's come with the expansion of higher ed and the corporate model is just has just degraded the meaning of of the the meaningfulness of of learning and of 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 you know in of in intellectual development and discovery and critical thinking and the best thing we could do is just sever as, as much as possible sever the relationship between the schools and the workplace just let schools do what they do best and let work the workplaces let people know what you might need to know to get a job, if you want to get it in school, if you want to get it some other way, if you want to do it on your own, if you want to do it in small groups, if you want to do it in your own basement. I mean, just what do you need to know to prepare to apply for this job? It doesn't matter what kind of piece of paper you have to bring to that corporate person, but the corporations are in on that too because it, it, it gives them the excuse to exclude large groups of people and to, and to whine about the fact that they're not creating jobs because kids aren't qualified for those jobs. And that's exactly another one of the things that George Gollin is buying into in this campaign. He's quoting this ridiculous assertion by Kraft that they can't get qualified applicants for $50,000 a year job, jobs to work at their plant in Champaign because there, there are too many kids without the one-year community college certificate needed to allegedly get these jobs. It's bogus and it's nonsense. And George Gollin buying into this is every bit as awful as anybody buying, buying a, medical, a medical diploma uh, and, and, and practicing medicine. Yeah. There's a lot of mythology and folklore out there that you're uh, going to have to fight. But, uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, um, this stuff about a uh, good school, a good college, you know, and uh, uh, should you go to one and how do you judge whether it's a good one or not? There are the U.S. News and World Report uh, rankings and so on, which are kind of... Uh, we're, we're all guilty so of buying into that for, yeah, our own yeah. for the sake yeah. of our own children, you yeah. know. Nobody wants to, you know, yeah. their own children to suffer just because you... You have principles, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, right. So we all, you know, we yeah. all do this. I'm not yeah. saying that anybody's yeah. anybody's excluded from this. I'm not yeah. above all this. I'm yeah. just saying let's look at the reality of what it is and the big picture of of uh, of school reform. Yeah. Of what's called school reform. I'm reminded or of accreditation uh, or whatever. Yeah. Saying attributed to the great sage Frank Zappa, if you want to get laid, <laughs> go to college. If you want an education, go to the library. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I suppose that says something about his social success. <laughs> right. uh, still. 
Um, in any case, uh, the, the well-rounded education, uh, the well-rounded student, seems to me, is often one has had the edges taken off, right? Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. it, I think that that may be the best metaphor for uh, one of the major changes in higher education in the last uh, decade or so, and that is this explosion of tuition expenses. Mm -hmm. It's far more expensive to go to college today uh, than it was a generation ago, and that's not an accident. It's not because everything's gotten more expensive. It's not because of the, uh, it's well, you're necessary in order to pay for higher education. There's no reason, there's no economic reason at all that higher education in this country couldn't be free, mm -hmm. as it is in many other countries, including Mexico, uh, which has a good higher education system and uh, a fraction of the wealth that the United States has, of course. Uh, part of it we've taken away with NAFTA, after all. But um, the, uh, the, the notion that, well, you know, tuition just goes up and up and up uh, because that's the way things are, uh, that is actually covers over what I think is actually quite a conscious program by American higher education that was profoundly shocked by uh, the uh, peace movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement on campus of more than a generation ago. Ron quoted um, uh, earlier the statistic that the uh, opposition to the war in the Middle East, Obama's war in the Middle East, now involves more Americans than were involved in opposition to the war in Southeast Asia, the Vietnam War, uh, of those uh, dear departed years. Now, what that produced in the American college was an explosion of political concern on the part of students, uh, and American universities were not prepared for that. Uh, you had to live through it to realize just how frightened American universities were by the anti-war movement on campus. Uh, they really were, and they moved heaven and earth uh, to make sure that that wouldn't happen again. And one way they made sure it wouldn't happen again is that they made sure that students understood that they would come out of college with a great load of debt, most of them, and that uh, they would have to mind their P's and Q's if they're going to let their college education get them a job that will allow them to pay their debts and perhaps also, uh, you know, uh, live a little uh, beyond that. Uh, this, is, this, this isn't an accident. This wasn't something the colleges sort of backed into. I mean, from the late 60s on, colleges were thinking about ways they could make sure they could get a docile uh, student body and, you know, look around at the, at the Bush-Obama wars. They did. You, you know, I, I tried to do, I, I asked the question related to my campaign, how much would it take for college education, public higher education, to be basically free? And the conclusion I've arrived at through, you know, just looking at various figures and data is probably about 100 to 150 billion dollars, okay, in terms of the current prices and what's being charged, what's being paid for by the state, and what's being charged to students. That's about 1%, less than 1% of our GDP. Not very much. Um, there, there's no reason why we couldn't take another 1% of our GDP. Uh, 150 to 200 billion dollars, even if it was 200 billion, um, and devote it to having kids not go into debt for the rest of their lives for going to college. Um, it, it's, it's not, it wouldn't be that expensive in terms of the bigger, the That's bigger about, picture. About two months of the Pentagon budget. Exactly. Is that, is that right, um, David? Yeah, uh, right, yeah, well, um, yeah, well, that's, uh, it, the less, it, but I'm doing it'd yes. Be right. about a quarter, in, in terms of current figures, not to nitpick about it, but it'd be right. about probably three months of the Pentagon. Oh, wow. Pentagon hey, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> That'll kick it over right there. You yeah, know, right, right, that right, right, right. No, no. That, I mean, so many ways that so many ways that the government, without even borrowing that money, could 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 save on what on the way it's doing things now, uh, in terms of medical care or militarism or taxation or any number. Um, it's, it's abusive. Uh, we're abusing, and the bottom line is we're abusing students from, from kindergarten on up with this notion that they have to, quote unquote, work hard to get, to yeah. get ahead in right. this economy with the high stakes testing and then the college applications and then the debt and then the looking for a job. It's, um, it's just a cruel and, and abusive system that we all should be extremely fed up with right now. The cliché recommendation is that do we need to raise standards. We need higher standards. Yeah. Does that mean anything to you? 
Well, you it know. does mean something to me, but in a very different context. Yes. In a very different context. Yeah. Not what they're talking about. Yeah. What about the struggle against great inflation? <laughs> Which has reached <laughs> again moral hazard. Yeah. We, you know, kids are going into debt and paying all this money for higher ed. They deserve good grades. That's what they're paying for. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in my in my uh, declining years, I've uh, as I think about my own college education, um, the thing that's borne in on me with much most force is how little the time I spent actually uh, in the library, as Frank Zappa said. But I mean, in the library, in the sense of reading. Uh, what's the phrase, uh, uh, Dover Beach phrase? The best of what's been thought, and, uh, best of what's been thought and said, eh? Mm -hmm. Well, that's I mean, Arnold, yeah. Uh, yeah. Arnold, as I was looking for. Um, yeah. I'm looking for uh, a college program that's essentially a great books program. Those people who've been saying that for a century now are right. And uh, that's really what it should be. You should uh, going to college means you should read grown-up books. You should sit down and read the books. You shouldn't read Professor So and So's article about it. You shouldn't worry about uh, uh, a pi piling up grades that will get you a fraction of a point higher and therefore a a, uh, a better job offer when you come out of that. It shouldn't be a filtering system for the corporate for corporate entities like that. It shouldn't be a race for glittering prizes like my friends at the business school. Um, it should be a, a chance to think about the best that's been thought and said. Uh, and, and, uh, and discuss it with your fellow students absolutely. and with professors what? who obviously can you know, have the skills to guide one. Aren't Cliff's notes enough? <laughs> they are. <laughs> They are, if indeed you have a chance to sit around, as David suggests, for, you have a chance you, to sit around and talk about them. For you, they were enough. <laughs> <laughs> Let's eat, I don't think we need to go that far. <laughs> uh, right. What else explains the hats? Huh? Yeah, right. right. Uh, right. Yeah. You've been watching news from Neptune for the first week of 2014, the excommunication edition. Now, I was supposed to talk about the Pope today under that rubric. Oh, we didn't uh, get you, we didn't let you get that well, far. Yeah, sorry, we're postponing Carl. the Pope once okay. again, aren't oh, we? Oh, no, the yeah. Pope is on the back burner, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> yeah. The Pope okay. and the devil are on the back burner. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> Uh, there, there's, there's no hope for the Pope as far as this program is concerned, but there is some in upcoming programs because the issue will uh, continue to, uh, sorry, be devilous. <laughs> and we will uh, uh, take the occasion of a later program uh, to talk about the situation of the Bishop of Rome. So. If our program has interested you today, you might want to look for similar programs here on Urbana Public Television, now not only in cable, but streaming online at urbanapublictelevision.org. I'm Carl Esterbrook. My discussions tonight on News from Neptune have been Ron Zoak and David Green. I can be reached at carl at newsfromneptune.com and see our Facebook page as well. I'm happy to receive your comments. Our thanks to UPTV, especially Jake, Jason, and Caleb, and Caleb particularly for getting uh, our programs up on uh, YouTube. Inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune and maybe even the Pope. Uh, to remind you in the words of Edward de Vere, what's past is prologue, what to come, and yours and my discharge. In the meantime, confusion to our enemies, and a good night to you. <laughs>